everybody. It's really nice to sort of see you all there in the chat room. Happy Thursday. I am Emily, and I'm the head of communities here at Two Diabetes. And this is our weekly Thursday live interview. And our guest today is Francisca Spritzler, who is a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes educator, and also runs a blog called Low Carb Dietitian. And we'll be talking about low carbing and her experiences and all of what she does. So welcome, Francisca. Please tell us all about yourself. Well, thanks so much, Emily. I'm so excited to be here. Um, as Emily said, my name is Francisca Spritzler, and I am a dietitian and a certified diabetes educator. I've been a dietitian since about 2008, and it was a second career for me. I was a court reporter for 10 years, and I went back to school because I had a real passion for nutrition and wanted to help people get healthy by making better food choices. And uh, I got into diabetes management about two years after I started, and I was really interested in it. And I think I ate about the way that I told my patients to eat, which was kind of following the healthy plate method, you know, kind of a low-fat diet, um, throwing out egg, you know, the egg yolks and eating only the whites, doing a lot of low-fat things, but a very high-fiber diet, too, with a lot of beans and rice. And uh, I was a pescatarian, meaning I ate fish, but I was kind of vegetarian aside from that. But I don't think I ate a lot of carbs. And I had my A1C checked. Um, a few years ago, and it was higher than I thought it would be. It was 5.5, which isn't very high, but I had a low fasting sugar, of, you know, in the low 80s, and I was, you know, kind of thin, and I thought, seems a little bit high. I wonder if my blood sugar is kind of going up after meals. So I started, I bought a glucometer, and I started checking my blood sugar, and it was, you know, fairly high, like in the 160s after kind of a mixed meal of 50 grams of carb, and I had been taught that really anybody without any diabetes or blood sugar issues, your blood sugar really shouldn't go more than 140, even if you eat a really high carb meal. So that made me very curious what's going on. And oh, so, hang on a sec. Okay. And sorry, I think our broadcast just kicked in better. Oh. So there, so there, my, my broadcast started and was interrupting you. So now oh, I okay. it. Go ahead. Okay, great. So I bought the glucometer and I said, you know, I, I got some high readings. And that led me to kind of search online and I came to the Two Diabetes um, Forum. And I started reading and kind of lurking for a day or two. And then I thought, I have to ask questions and tell people about this. Is this normal? Have they heard anything like this? And I got to tell you, the community was very welcoming. I got a lot of really good information. And people said, well, you know, you might have the early stages of diabetes. This is how it starts, is your, your postprandial blood sugar kind of goes south first. And your fasting can be normal for a while. So and then they said, well, you know, at your, your, uh, you know I'm, I'm, I, was, I guess I was 44 at the time. but. Uh, I, you know, pretty thin, and they said, you may have, like, the slow-developing type 1 LADA, LADA. Um, so I got really into that. I was pretty sure that's probably what I had. I had the antibodies. I didn't, I don't have that. Um, but I started to reduce my carbohydrate intake in response to some of the advice I was getting. And I, I realized when I looked online, some of the members that were really following a, a low-carbohydrate diet had excellent blood sugar control and said that it improved by cutting their carbs. So I started cutting back. As I said, I was probably doing about 50 grams a meal. Maybe I didn't say that, but that's about what I was doing. So I, I cut back a little bit, so I was doing maybe 30 or 40 grams, and that helped um, somewhat. But I still, you know, occasionally would go into the higher numbers, and uh, my fasting was always normal. Um, I also had, I realized I had what was called what's called reactive hypoglycemia, meaning like an hour or two after eating, I'd sometimes get shaky, especially if I had a meal that wasn't super mixed, didn't have enough protein or fat in it. If it was just straight carbs, um, you know, my blood sugar I think was going up very quickly and down again very quickly. So I learned, you know, having more mixed meals was helpful. Um, and around this time, I, I started my blog because, you know, I had cut back, you know, on my carbs quite a bit and noticed a difference, and I, I just heard from other people who had also um, had this response to cutting carbs. So I started my blog to try to show people that there were some dietitians who were actually okay with eating less than 130 grams of carb a meal. I mean, I'm sorry, per day, because that's usually what uh, people advised me. They were told by 
certified diabetes educators and dietitians is that you can't go below 130 grams a day because your brain needs 130 grams of glucose for fuel every day. So if you go lower than that, you're putting your brain at risk. So I, I, I realized I actually felt better and I was eating about 100 grams, maybe less of carbs a day and I didn't feel it was affecting my brain and I started reading uh, books from uh, people like Dr. Bernstein, who advocates a very, very low carb approach, and uh, Gary Taubes who wrote Good Calories, Bad Calories, and a few other low carb books. And I found that, you know, the kind of the lower the carbs you ate, the better your blood sugar control was in general. And I was noticing the same thing. And around this time, the American Diabetes Association asked me to write an article for them on a low carb. Uh, Whole Foods approach to diabetes and weight management, which I did, and I kind of wrote it based on the way that I was eating, about you know about maybe 80 net grams of carb a day, and but I in my back of my mind though I thought, am I still always going to have these occasional high blood sugars? Because I would sometimes when I test to be under 140, it was still sometimes I actually got a few readings um, over 200, even when I was kind of lower carb, like 100 grams a day. So last year, around August, I decided I'm going to just try the really low carb approach. I have a few friends that I made on two diabetes who follow like 30 grams, 50 grams of carb, and I said, I'm going to try, see if it really makes any difference. And lo and behold, it really did. It made a huge difference. And ever since, I've never had a blood sugar over 120 that I've tested. I've um, consistently, an hour to two hours after eating, had you know, really well controlled blood sugar. And so, you know, I'm an advocate of low carb, however people want to do it. Not everyone wants to do Dr. Bernstein. I think it can work for everyone. I really do. I think anybody who follows that, that program is going to have well-controlled blood sugar. But it's very strict, and I understand not everyone wants to do it. Uh, so I think, you know, any level of carb restriction, what someone's comfortable with, is what I'm comfortable with for them, whatever works with their lifestyle, whatever they're willing to do. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy with, you know, I do get about 30 to 35 grams of carb a day myself, and I'm, I feel great. I have more energy, I feel like, than I've had in, uh, in years, and, and right now I, I work at the VA, as I think you mentioned, or I know at least it was on the, uh, like the publicity that you did, and I do that, but I'm also doing a lot of outside work, too, some consulting, and um, I'm writing for Answers.com, and in, in January I'm actually going to start private practice. So I'm doing all of these things, and I feel like, you know, at almost 47, I have more energy than I had in my 20s and 30s, and I don't think it's just due to diet. I think it's partly due to, you know, having better blood sugar control, which is being happy overall that I'm, I'm doing something I'm so passionate about. So anyway, that's me. I hope there's lots of questions, because it may, I, I've, I talked about myself a lot just now, but I don't really like doing it that much. <laughs> so I'd really rather just take questions from people and find out what people want to know, and and, uh, and see if, if there's anything out there that I can um, help them with. Absolutely. First off, bef before we do questions, Francisca, can you tip your computer screen down just sure. a little bit? Okay. Yeah, just so we can see your whole face. We were oh, okay. missing, we were were you missing your chin. Me? Oh, okay. No, we were most of you. Okay, we were just good. missing your chin. Missing my chin, okay. <laughs> now right. we can all of you. All right, um, great. One of, the, one of the questions that's come up that's been raised by a couple of people already in the chat room is what exactly do you consider low carb versus moderate carb? Do you, is there like a specific guideline that you can give? Okay, so I think that um, there's no universal for this, but I think that like moderate low carb to me is somewhere between 100 and 150 grams a day, and low carb is between maybe 50 and 100, and very low carb would be between like 20 to 30 or 35 grams. So there's kind of a little overlap in there, but maybe maybe 20 to 50 um, for the very low carb and 50 to 100 for kind of the um, low carb and then moderate low carb, 100 to 150. But you know, there's been, I've seen online, because I've looked to see is there a consensus, and there's not really one. Um, there's different, uh, some different researchers have proposed different scales, but something like that. So I'd say anywhere between, and I really don't think anyone needs to go down to 20 necessarily, but I do know people who, who do eat that low, um, somewhere between 20 to 150 a day. I know 20 seems tough. That's the Atkins induction that usually people only stay on for you know a couple weeks, and that's to kind of kickstart your fat burning. 
Uh, but I, I do know of one gentleman who has type 2 diabetes who does consume less than 20 grams of carb a day. He's type 2, but he's able to maintain good, like normal blood sugars, eating that amount and just taking metformin, whereas before he was on three different medications. So, and he's, you know, it's very restrictive, but he does it. Uh, I feel like 10 grams of carb more for me makes things a lot easier because I think, you know, I could easily do 20 grams, um, you know, within my first two meals and kind of have real trouble with the third meal keeping it really, you know, to zero grams. But some people are doing it, and I just think whatever works for the person is best. So, and, and no judgment for anybody who wants to go higher in carb and finds that works for them. I just know that there's a lot of people who do struggle with diabetes control, and they find a huge benefit in lowering their carb intake. Mm -hmm. Marie, Marie is reminding me that we get a lot of, um, we have a lot of conversations on 2 Diabetes asking for low-carb breakfast ideas. Mm -hmm. People get sort of egged and baconed out yes. and then are at a bit of a loss for what else to eat. Do you, do you have any suggestions? Well, you know what? I'm working on a blog. That's so funny because I'm working on a, a post right now for Answers.com about uh, some breakfast ideas, but I think you can do smoothies with protein powder, some berries, and maybe a, some Greek yogurt, and you can still have a very low-carb breakfast that way. That's the only really way to do a smoothie. Most smoothies are loaded with carbs and sugar, but if you do that, there's also some very, very low-carb almond milks on the, on the market and coconut milk that you could use in there as well, um, but usually like a, a whey protein smoothie with, uh, and you can put almond butter in there too, so you get a little more fiber, um, so that's one. Let me think what else I was thinking for uh, <laughs> for the morning. Oh, I like this one for for people who like salmon. Um, and like, there's there's something. My husband's from Philadelphia, and he likes a bagel with cream cheese and salmon, like smoked salmon. But you could do that with tomato slices in place of the bagel. So you do you know tomato slices with cream cheese and salmon on top, and that's super low carb. I think that would be great for some of the Bernstein people who will try to save six grams of carbs or less for breakfast. That would be less than six grams. <laughs> I, I'm actually a breakfast person. That's probably one of my bigger carb meals. But yes, there's people who are doing six grams of carb every day and for breakfast. And, and usually it's just bacon and eggs and maybe some kale or something. I do like kale with eggs. I think that's a great breakfast. I do that a lot. But I know eggs, you know, after a while can get tiring. I know. <laughs> I'm making faces is why Francisca is laughing right now. I personally am not a big egg fan. <laughs> You don't so, like eggs? You don't like them? Oh, they're my favorite. No, I um, I I eat them on occasion for the protein. Yeah. But uh, I'd really rather not. That's okay. We yeah. we what? We do what we must. That's right. You're not the only one. There's a lot of people who don't like eggs. Yeah. So we have a question from Terry who says, for low diabetic for for low diabetics for diabetics that adhere to a lower carb diet less than 75 grams per day. What are their common nutritional shortfalls? What's the biggest nutritional mistake that they tend to make? This is an awesome question, Terry. It is an awesome question. Really depends on what your diet is composed of. I feel that if you're eating good quality protein at every meal and getting vegetables at every meal, that's the thing is some people, you know, they'll do 75 grams of carb, but they're maybe, you know, eating some of the uh, like low carb tortillas or something for part of their um, for part of their car part of their carb intake, and I think if you're doing lots of vegetables um, and eating fatty fish a few times a week to get the omega three fats, um, there's very little you're going to fall short on. Actually, meat and animal products in general have all of the micronutrients, and pork is actually the highest source of thiamine, and it's really difficult to meet your thiamine intake if you don't eat any pork, unless you're eating a lot of nuts and seeds. I mean, a lot. So uh, I would say the only, uh, the only vitamin that's actually found in plant foods and not found in, in uh, animal foods is vitamin C. But you can get vitamin C in tomatoes. You get it in spinach. You get it in, in fact, a, a few cups of uh, dark leafy green lettuce has more than 100% of the vitamin C that you need. So it's actually very difficult to develop. I know people say, oh, you're, going, you're not going to have enough calcium. Well, if you eat dairy products, you'll get calcium. And if you eat leafy greens, you'll get calcium as well. And I'm trying to think of, of some others. Um, you know, there's, 
magnesium is something that people with diabetes just tend to fall short on just because they have increased magnesium needs. So you may need to supplement with magnesium. I think that's a, a good idea. Um, but the, in terms of the amount of magnesium your diet's providing, it's probably providing close to or maybe even more than the, the RDA uh, for, you know, for the nutrient. But you may want to take a supplement anyway. Um, and that's the one thing I would definitely supplement on. And otherwise, I, I recommend maybe a multivitamin supplement and then supplementing depending on what your blood tests show. I don't recommend just supplementing um, thinking you know, that you read something somewhere that this is good and, and I need to take this because I have diabetes. I, do, um, I, I don't think that you'll necessarily run into any nutrient shortfalls if you have a well-balanced diet with plenty of variety too. And... Uh, yeah, but that is a, a great question because most people do think you're not getting a balanced diet because you're not eating whole grains, but there's nothing that's in whole grains that you can't get in a mix of uh, plant foods like uh, vegetables and, and low sugar fruits like berries and, and meat and eggs and dairy products. You actually, you actually already answered one of the other questions, which was, do you take supplements or recommend supplements? Um, and I, I do take a few, just based on my own. I have thyroid um, disease, and so I take a few um, supplements that are supposed to be good for, uh, for that. Um, I'll tell you what they are. Uh, ashwagandha I take. I know, sounds weird, doesn't it? But that's supposed to be helpful <laughs> with making the conversion from, um, from T4, which is the inactive thyroid hormone, to T3, which is the active thyroid hormone. Um, or you know the 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 one that's actually responsible for uh, uh, metabolism and and so many other things in the body. Uh, what else do I take? I do take vitamin C as well. Um, I take iodine, um, it's a very small dose now of iodine, and um, I take magnesium, and I take uh, multivitamin, and I think that's about it. <laughs> Have you seen those um, those supplements that are specifically for people with diabetes? Mm -hmm. I know they sell them at Walgreens. I'm sure a lot of, of drugstores, and they they specifically say that they're for people with diabetes. Do you have any thoughts on those? You know, I don't I don't know because I think we're all so different that I I think it's difficult to put out a multivitamin that's going to cover everyone with diabetes. I think they have more of um, certain phytochemicals that are good for your eyes that help to protect, prevent against um, macular degeneration and some of the other eye diseases that are more common in people with diabetes. So I, I think that's what it is. It probably does. I need to look at them myself, actually. I, it probably has more magnesium. It may have chromium in it uh, because that's supposed to be helpful also with uh, blood sugar control. And just let me bring up cinnamon really quickly. Um, cinnamon. <laughs> People, uh, there is just a new study out that shows cinnamon um, can be helpful with blood sugar control. I find this much more in people who are insulin resistant, people who have type 2 diabetes than type 1. And I do think it helps with insulin sensitivity. But if your main, you know, if your issue is that you have type 1 diabetes and you're injecting insulin, if you're insulin resistant, it may help you. But if you're not insulin resistant, you don't have that profile, um, I can't say for sure that cinnamon will help. It's not going to hurt. It tastes great. It doesn't add any carbs or very few, and they're mostly fiber. So go ahead and add cinnamon, but it, it may not do all that much to the type 1s. I must say it's ironic that you mentioned cinnamon <laughs> because really? just yesterday in the office, mm -hmm. uh, we were getting a good chuckle about an article uh, touting the effects of cinnamon for blood sugar. Now, this is an office filled with people who have type 1 diabetes is who was present at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were saying that perhaps we should have more cinnamon buns and cinnamon muffins and how helpful that would be. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize, though, I didn't actually read the article. I didn't realize, though, that the issue is that it can help with insulin sensitivity. Um, that's, and you have found that to, to actually seem like it is true and works? I have, I've, I've found it in some people, but it's, it's in the context of already following kind of a, a lower carb diet. So doing like a cinnamon bun or something like that, or a cinnamon latte at, at Starbucks, I don't think that would really work. But if you're using cinnamon as like a flavor enhancer on already low carb items, I think it can help for people who have insulin resistance. Yes. But we're all different, and maybe some people aren't going to be as responsive to it as others. Right, very good caveat. 
<laughs> so we have another question in the chat room, um, and I'm sorry, I forget who asked this question, but the, but it is. I need to gain weight, but I need lower carbs for for blood sugar control. What are your thoughts? Okay, um, and we don't know if this is a type one or type two person, do we? Sadly, I don't. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say if it's a type two, and usually I can't say there aren't underweight type twos because there are some who need to gain weight, but it's usually the type ones that I find that have this trouble. Um, I would say going up on fat and protein to the degree that you can. Increasing protein usually helps for you to gain weight, but you're probably going to need a little more insulin too. Um, but protein will help to put on weight and put it on kind of in a healthier way than doing carbs. It's going to help to help you to gain more muscle provided that you're doing some kind of physical activity. So I would say increase your protein portions and uh, you know you can still bump up the fat a little bit too but maybe a little more fatty meat, maybe some like ricotta cheese, uh, that sort of thing. So you're getting kind of a balance, some, some protein, also some fat. Um, that's what I would recommend. But um, it's hard to see too kind of um, you know I'm answering the question but I don't know exactly what she's eating. I know she has to keep low carb and I think that's great. To gain weight, low carbs sometimes can be difficult, especially if you're a person who is naturally thin. So I would say bumping up the protein and to some extent the fat as well. Yeah. Awesome. We have some a few questions about fat. And the first is from it says, for more than a generation, saturated fats have been vilified as nutritional culprits. What's your position on saturated fat? Yeah, I feel that saturated fat have really gotten a bad rap and it, there's been a lot of misinterpretation of the evidence that's out there. We actually know that saturated fat, when um, in the context of a low carbohydrate diet, uh, it may or may not raise your LDL cholesterol, which is quote unquote your bad cholesterol, but it, it does that in about a third of the people who follow a carb restricted diet. Another third will actually have their cholesterol, their LDL cholesterol go down, and the other third, um, the last third, will be, um, you know, their, their cholesterol won't change. But how much of that LDL cholesterol, it, you know, how high can cholesterol be before it's uh, a problem? It's different for everybody. Um, I have found that saturated fat, I've increased my saturated fat considerably since, uh, yeah, definitely. I, I probably... The, the American Diabetes Association says, you know, 7% of, of your intake should be saturated fat. I'm well over double that. I would, I would need to actually check to see what it is, but saturated fats don't necessarily raise cholesterol, and even if they do, they tend to promote a, uh, a more uh, uh, large, kind of fluffy, less atherogenic type of LDL. It's less likely to get into, um, into your... Uh, into your arteries and cause problems, and it's the small dense LDL that we really have to worry about. Saturated fat actually raises the HDL almost universally, and the HDL is your healthy cholesterol. It lowers, well I can't say the saturated fat on its own, lowers triglycerides, but in the context of a low carbohydrate diet, high fat intake usually results in lower triglycerides and higher HDL, and now that's being seen as, as um, one of the markers of uh, improved or uh, decreased risk for heart disease is having a higher HDL, lower triglycerides, and a higher HDL to cholesterol ratio, total cholesterol. And my cholesterol numbers, somehow, I, they improved so much actually. I've always had high LDL cholesterol and that I'm never going to be within range, but it's actually come down a bit. My triglycerides are super low and my HDL is almost 100, which is you know, anything over 60 for a woman is good. Mine was always in the 60s, kind of the 70s, but it's actually gone up and my LDL has gone down. And saturated fat, I, I was actually just reading something a couple weeks ago from uh, a couple of low-carb researchers, Jeff Volek, Dr. Jeff Volek and Dr. Steve Finney on saturated fats. And they find that people who follow a low-carb diet but eat a lot of saturated fats, those saturated fats are burned for energy rather than being stored in your body. So having saturated fat that's in your bloodstream that's stored in your body. It's not healthy, but actually a lot of the saturated fat uh, that most people have in their bloodstream is from carbohydrate intake. Carbohydrates are converted to fat. It's called de, de, novo, gen, uh, ah, de novo lipogenesis. 
And it's you actually, so they've done studies on this, quite a few, and found that people who follow a higher carbohydrate diet have more saturated fat in their blood, even though they're consuming a lower saturated fat intake. They may be consuming very few saturated fats, but at a higher carbohydrate intake, they convert that carbohydrate into saturated fats. And the saturated fat that the people on the low carbohydrate diet are eating, those are burned very, uh, very readily for fuel. So they are not they don't cause problems in the blood. So having high saturated fat in the blood is problematic, but having high LDL cholesterol may or may not be depending on what the rest of your lipid profile looks like. So that was a very long question, I mean answer to a kind of a short question, but there's a lot of research now on saturated fat, uh, several meta-analysis that show that it is not linked to heart disease. I think that's part of the problem too is why a lot of CDEs and RDs recommend a very low fat diet because people with diabetes are definitely at increased risk for heart disease um, among other problems and they think that following a low fat diet is going to be cardioprotective but I think a high fat high carb diet is the worst of all worlds. A low fat um, high carbohydrate diet may be okay for some people but a high fat, high carbohydrate, I mean, I'm sorry, high fat, low carbohydrate diet, I think for many people with diabetes and metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, I think it really does um, decrease the risk for heart problems. Hang on. There I am. What are your views, your views on coconut oil versus olive oil? I like both of them. I love them both. I use them both almost every day. I like olive oil on salads, definitely on salads, also on cucumber, on tomatoes, on all kinds of things. And I cook with it sometimes if it's not going to be a really high heat. It's a monounsaturated fat, which means it's fairly stable, much more stable than the polyunsaturated fats like safflower oil and sunflower oil. Coconut oil, though, is highly saturated. It's more saturated than butter. It's like 97% saturated fat. So it's very stable at high temperatures. It does not become oxidized. So I use that to cook kale. I sometimes use it to cook eggs. Um, I love it. I actually think it tastes good. Some people think it tastes disgusting. You know, whatever. <laughs> uh, if you don't like it, you can actually, you know, if you use it to cook with and you kind of season it with a little salt or whatever you're cooking, it's fine. But I think it tastes pretty good. And uh, uh, I think coconut oil is great. Uh, it's got lauric acid, which has a lot of antimicrobial properties to it. So, um, so I like them both. Those are two of my favorite oils. Yeah, good question. Fantastic. <laughs> we need some suggestions for good fats for people with gallbladder disease because they do not digest fats well. Okay, so this is a, a tough one because uh, everyone's different. I would say for people with gallbladder disease, you may want to stick to um, like the olive oil. And I would try coconut oil as well. Maybe not the dairy fat so much. Um, those can be a little bit hard to digest, and for people with gallbladder problems, um, this is honestly, I, it's not my area of expertise, but I, I do have a friend who had gallbladder issues, and she had problems tolerating high-fat dairy, but she could do almost every other oil. So I would say olive oil is, is going to be good, and I would try coconut oil. If you can tolerate small amounts of maybe butter, um, it's still a healthy fat, but if you find that it gives you any problems with your gallbladder, then I would just cut it out. But you do need some healthy fats in your diet, regardless, even you know whatever disease you have. Um, very, very rare that somebody can get by, I think, on a very, very low-fat diet and not develop some kind of deficiency, some kind of fatty acid deficiency. So um, also uh, fish oil. So fatty fish, if you can do fatty fish to get the omega-3 fats in. So fatty fish would be salmon. Everyone knows about that one. But also, sorry, Emily, I don't know if you like these or not, but sardines and herring. <laughs> I had a feeling. I just had this feeling you weren't going to like those. I, I like them personally, but I understand people who don't. Mackerel? No? Okay. Those are fishy fish, kind of fishy fish, but they're very high in omega-3 fats which are one of the essential fatty acids. So that would be important too. So someone with gallbladder disease, you may not want to have you know, fish oil all by itself. It's, it's nasty by itself and it might be a little concentrated, but in the form of fatty fish, I think it would be good. Fantastic. So we have someone in the chat room with us right now named Shoshana, who is 80 years old 
and has had type 1 diabetes for 77 years. Wow, okay, congratulations. Yeah. That's I think she's our longest time type 1 in the community as far as I know. And she has developed some gastroparesis mm -hmm. and would also like some suggestions for um, diet, diet in general for someone with gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is such a tough one. Um, so doing liquid meals sometimes can help with that. Uh, so like the smoothie that I talked about for breakfast, that, that tends to leave your stomach faster than solid foods do. So you're kind of doing some liquid meals. Um, you know, maybe keeping the fat, overall you still want to have fat in your diet, but keeping the fat, um, you know, kind of more moderate, not a super high fat meal, because that tends to stay in your stomach longer. And so does fiber. You want to have some fiber in the form of, uh, like, vegetables, leafy greens, avocado, those are fine. But a very, very high fiber food, like, uh, like chia seeds or flax, that might end up tying things up too long in your stomach. So those are the things I would recommend. It's, it's really a difficult problem, and I wish there was, um, you know, another way to treat it. But it's basically just kind of watching your meals, trying to do more liquid meals, and, uh, and watching the fat and the, the fiber in each one of your meals. So, you know, I'd recommend doing maybe a couple of extra smaller meals, but if your stomach's not emptying um, and your stomach, you know, it's hard to eat once you've still got st food in your stomach. So maybe trying to do three kind of moderate meals a day and try to eat your last meal well before you go to bed so that you can um, hopefully digest it so that you're not sleeping with your food. It's, you know, really difficult to sleep that way. Thank you. Sure. Uh, David is saying, we've, we've been hearing a lot for a long time of that... Let me start that one again. <laughs> I'm not a reader per se. That's okay. I think you're doing great. We've been hearing for a long time that chromium is helpful. Some authors, Jenny Rule, for example, cast doubt on that. Her argument is that chromium supplementation may help prevent the progression to diabetes, but that there is serious doubt whether it helps if you already have diabetes. What are your thoughts on chromium? My thoughts on chromium, I, I think that if you are chromium deficient, you need to take it. So you have to have your, che your levels checked before you take it. And many people with diabetes are deficient. So then you supplement until you're at you know, the, the, the goal level, and then you have it rechecked, and you maybe go, come down on it. But not everyone needs to take it. If you're not deficient, it's not going to help you. So you need to, to check and have that, that level checked in your body. I know, more blood tests, but that's, that's the only way to really know. Uh, I don't think it will necessarily hurt you to take chromium as long as you're not taking huge doses, but are you going to see any effect? Probably not unless you were deficient. And if you were deficient and you take it, it should help with blood sugar control. All right. We have a question now from Nyadach who says, to provide... 4,000 to 6,000 calories, some need for activities. This, this uh, person in our chat room is an avid, avid cyclist. Mm -hmm. The whole eating a lettuce, leaf, tomato, nuts <laughs> ain't going to cut it. So what else other than eating a block of lard would provide this, this much energy for high activity? Okay, good question. So fatty meats have a lot of protein, fat, and calories. So doing fatty meats would be helpful. Block of lard, not so much, but cheese and the nuts. You'd be amazed. Uh, one cup of walnuts has about 900 calories. So that's about a quarter of your, your days right there. And yes, um, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily eat them all at once, but you know, like a cup or two cups of walnuts right there, that's a lot of calories. Um, you know, there's Goodness, I'm trying to think of all the high-fat foods, uh, avocado and um, cheese, eggs, um, you know, some berries. If you're an avid cycler, um, I don't know if you're type 1 or type 2, but either way, you can do, you know, maybe a little, a few more carbs if you're that active. You could do some more fruit and, uh, goodness, I'm trying to think of some other things. Um, I'm not sure if this person's following a, a low-carb diet or not, but... To get three or four thousand calories in a low carb diet, it's definitely doable by doing a lot of nuts, fatty meats, cheese, eggs. The, the calories definitely will add up if you're doing larger portion sizes. And for you, you know, with cycling, you know, doing like a pre meal and a post meal, 
snack as well. That'll increase your calories. So, um, yeah, you need a lot of calories. Good for you. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm not sure what kind of cycling you do, but it sounds uh, very intense. So, <laughs> something I would never do, but I'm, I'm impressed by those who do. It sure does sound intense. <laughs> for some of us, that would be several days worth of food all in one day. That's right. Um, and obviously, maybe if several weeks worth of exercise on that same day. <laughs> yeah. So here's another one. This is a great question. Have you had any heated pushback from your professional peers, registered dietitians, regarding encouraging people to use a low-carb diet? Um, not to my face. <laughs> not to my face, really. I do think that it's going on behind my back. I, I you know, because <laughs> there's a few very, very vocal RDCDEs that are well known, and I'm not a name namer kind of person. I'm not going to do it, but um, she, one of them wrote a blog post, I would say maybe half a year, a year ago, saying that she was very concerned about all of the you know anti carb things that are going on, and she's reading the blogs and she's seeing all of these things. And um, so my my supervisor at work, who's not really low carb, but she respects my opinion, she read it. And she goes. Do you think she was talking about you? And I said, she probably, among other people, she may very well have been. I would say most people that comment on my blog do so because they support what I'm saying. Every once in a while, I'll get, um, I did get one dietitian from one of my blog posts a, a few times ago who was, you know, just saying she thought it was okay to do a carb, but it's, you know, it's not realistic that most people can't do it, and the peop it's not safe for people with eating disorders because it may cause them to binge. And I will say, I think there's some truth to that. The people who truly have a dysfunctional relationship with food where they're, you know, uh, like starving and then binging, starving, binging, low carb may not work for them because they'll feel so restricted that they'll want to do it. But there's many people who have blood sugar issues and, you know, weight issues who don't have that binge mentality and actually feel better on low carb. So, uh, you know, I don't think we should say, well, because some people don't do well with it, we just don't want to, you know, offer to anybody in case they develop an eating disorder. I just, I don't think that that's wise either, but um, I haven't gotten too much pushback, as I said, that I know of, but I, I'm always concerned that it's coming because I have this on my website. Um, you know, I, I put down a big disclaimer saying that my views are not necessarily supported by the ADA or the American, it's called now the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics or American Heart Association or anything. Um, because I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, not get sued because I'm really not promoting their views. I'm promoting my own, the views that I have um, developed after doing lots of research. Also, many, many people who email me, I get lots of comments on my blog, but I get a lot of personal emails too, people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes who've had amazing improvements on low carb and are frustrated because either their doctors or their dietitians or family members, you know, don't agree with what they're doing. And so that's really why I do what I do. I want it to be an accepted option or alternative for people. I know that some people are not going to want to do it, and I think that's fine, and I, I think we should all have the choice for what we want to do, and, and I don't think that people with diabetes should be forced to, you know, consume the ADA diet or the, you know, whichever diet is being promoted, you know, this year by uh, the American, uh, I want to keep saying it, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I think that low carb should be an option, but not the only option. That's the other thing is I think some people say, well, you should be telling people everyone with diabetes should be following low carb if they want to get their blood sugar under control. I know that some people have their blood sugar under control, uh, under control on a higher carb diet. And if that works for you and you're happy, then I'm all for that. I just want people to have better blood sugar control and be happy. And however you want to do that is up to you. And um, far be it for me to criticize anybody. But I just want to offer an alternative and speak out about it so that hopefully, you know, it'll become more accepted. Long answer again, sorry. <laughs> we have no problem with long answers. Okay. We, have, we still have time. Okay, great. Um, so, th so there are some folks in the chat room who are curious whether you yourself have diabetes or experience with blood sugar fluctuation. Okay, so they probably didn't hear in my very beginning when I talked about that, but I do. I have what I call weird blood sugar. I don't have diabetes. I have normal fasting. It will always come back to normal no matter how high it goes. But if I eat too many carbohydrates, my blood sugar definitely goes up as high as 200 on two occasions, as high as 200. So that's technically, you can be diagnosed with diabetes when your blood sugar is over 200 twice, people say. But I, I just, the fact that I can control it 
completely with a low carb diet and the fact that my fasting blood sugar has never been higher than the 80s it's as I was saying to Emily before we started I think there's a spectrum of people with blood sugar issues who don't necessarily have diabetes um, per se so that's I kind of think where I am I'm somewhere in there where I don't respond to carbohydrates well I just don't a large carbohydrate amount or even kind of a moderate amount leaves my blood sugar to go too high and although it does come down that's stressing my beta cells to produce more insulin to bring the blood sugar down so I find that you know falling very low carb works really well for me and uh, and would, would I you know because I think somebody asked me well are you going to try to introduce carbohydrates again and see if maybe your, your tolerance has gotten better I could if I was really craving them but I'm not but uh, you know maybe for an experiment down the line I might do it but at this point, I, I just don't see any reason to. I, I feel pretty comfortable with where I'm at. Sorry, I'm. I'm. Uh, we just got a whole bunch of questions in the chat room, and I'm okay, great. Trying, trying to make sure that I don't miss any of them. So the next one is: What do you think about the paleo way of eating? I think it can be a very, very healthy diet because it's based on whole foods. Uh, I kind of follow that to some degree. I, tr I try to do no processed foods, a lot of grass-fed meat and pastured whenever I can, kind of eggs and organic things. But I do dairy, and I know that true paleo really wouldn't do dairy. Primal, which is what another is true paleo. Sorry to interrupt. Can you can okay. you tell yeah, us exactly what on, it is? It's 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 an eating a way of eating based on the Paleolithic era, so before agriculture. So no grains, no. Um, yeah, no grains, no processed foods, but they do consume sweet potatoes, some consume white potatoes, some even consume rice, saying it's a grass. It's, uh, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's not a, 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 you know, a strong definition on exactly what paleo is, but most people on a paleo diet, they don't eat dairy, and they think dairy is inflammatory, and, um, but I love dairy, so I, I, I and, you know, I, I think it's a healthy way of eating. I, I don't know that I necessarily want to go out there and, and say I'm with the paleo movement, although I, I am in a couple of groups that follow paleo things. So I'm more of a whole foods person, and um, whole foods low carb is what I say I am. But, um, but I think hippo can be healthy. I like the whole foods aspect of it. All right, the next one. Um, is a comment. I, I try low carb since I have not been able to be active for about a year, but now I have no energy and I'm not losing the weight that I need to. I'm not sure if it's medication or what I am eating. My blood sugar is good. Do you have any thoughts on this situation? Okay. Again, kind of hard to give advice to somebody when I don't know everything, but I do know, depending on the amount of carbohydrates that you're eating, um, if you're doing very low carbohydrate and you don't have a lot of energy, it, you may need to increase your salt intake. Now, I say that not knowing anything about you if you're on hypertensive medications or anything, so don't do anything that you hear me say without checking with your doctor first, especially if you're taking medication for something like that. But in general, when you follow a very low-carb diet, your body actually excretes salt. The, the kidneys filter out salt. You do need salt, especially in the early stages. Otherwise, you are going to feel tired. You may be headachy. You may have, it's called the low-carb flu. You, it's basically your body kind of transitioning to running primarily on glucose, which is you know the breakdown of carbohydrates, um, to a fat and ketones is what your primary fuels are when you're um, doing a very low carb diet. So making that transition, um, it's it's difficult to do, but if you add like maybe a cup of broth to your meals, or you know add a little bit of salt, that can help with feeling better. Um, also in the early stages, it does take a little while to acclimate to um, lower carb intake. So if you're if you just started doing it, you know, give yourself a little while. It can take I think four to six weeks altogether. But before you go out and do the salt thing, I do want you to talk to your doctor. Unless you're young and you don't have any issues at all, then I feel fairly safe with telling you you can have you know a cup of broth added to your meals. I think that'd be fine. All right. Next we have, do you find the high fat proteins and low carb to be more beneficial than low carb with low fat proteins? Is that just a personal choice or does it help with weight loss <coughs> Excuse me, or, main or maintenance of a healthy diet? 
I think that a truly well formulated low carb diet is high in fat. It's moderate in protein. It's not very high in protein. The, the reason for this is because you really can't burn protein as a fuel. You burn fat or glucose. So extra protein it's just going to have to be uh, gotten rid of basically what you can't use for maintenance of your structures um, and, and all the enzymes and proteins in your body that's going to be excreted it's kind of hard on your kidneys when you eat too high of a protein diet um, and, and keep the fats too low so I think you know and it's going to vary depending on your carbohydrate intake too so as far as the percentage of fat that you want to do, people always ask me that, what are the macronutrient percentages? It's different for everyone, but truly on a low-carb diet, I think you should be doing at least 50 to 60% of calories as fat. It sounds like a lot, but you have to realize that each gram of, of fat contains nine, gram, nine calories, and that's more than twice as much as the carbs and protein. So that's part of the reason the percentage is so high. It's not like you're just eating, you know, like putting five tablespoons of butter on all of your foods. Because that's a fast ticket to weight gain. <laughs> you know, even though they're fats and they are burned pretty well, if you eat too much of anything um, that you're, and you're not burning it off, then you're going to store it as fat. So, um, but a high fat, moderate carb, low, low, I'm sorry, moderate protein, low carb diet, I think that's the way to go. And it's just going to base, be based on your preference exactly how high fat um, and how low carb you want to go. The protein is, is pretty standard, somewhere between about 15 and a very high of 30%, I, I recommend somewhere between 15 and 25% of your intake should be protein. And that's regardless of what type of diet you're on, high carb, low carb, um, it shouldn't be too high. We don't do well with a super high protein intake. Is that true also for people who are really physically active and potentially people who do things like weightlifting? Do they, do they also need that amount of protein or do they need more? They probably can go in a little higher, but nobody needs more than 30%. There's no reason to eat more than 30%. But those people are usually eating more calories too. So 30% of a 3,000 calorie diet for protein is going to be a lot more than 30% on a 2,000 calorie diet. So they'll still be getting enough protein for you know muscle repair, muscle building, um, and to meet all their other needs, their protein needs. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, how do your low-carb diet ideas work for kids with type 1 diabetes? And this question is coming from someone who has a 9-year-old with type 1 who's very skinny but muscular, mm -hmm. and he's so slender that they have limited locations that they can put his insulin pump. He needs more meat on his bones. Um. Okay, so as far as low carb for kids, it can work. I think in this case, though, you would definitely want to have um, very good follow up with um, a dietitian working with him for ch for children, a dietitian or a or a, a doctor who's um, you know kids are just a little different. They have uh, different hormones going on, especially at nine years old. He's just going to start entering. Um, puberty pretty soon. Sorry, sorry. I know I don't want to rush his age, but nine years old, it start things start to happen pretty soon after that. Um, so he can still do low carb, but um, you know he's probably going to need different. You know his insulin's probably going to need to be adjusted. Um, so he, it can work. He'll probably need more protein too if he's trying to gain weight. So more protein, and I'm thinking for kids maybe more of a moderate kind of low carb diet, at least to start out. So maybe, you know, I don't know what he's doing now, but, you know, maybe 100 grams of carb and, and see how he does with that. If he's doing, like, 200 grams of carb right now, that would, you know, significantly decrease his insulin needs for um, mealtime insulin. And you just need to be, you know, very careful with titrating that. So this is where I'm, like, I'm answering these questions, and I just want you to know I'm giving you questions. I'm answering your questions, but I do want you to follow up with your doctor before you do any of these things that I talk about. Okay. So I have two questions of my own, and right now we don't. I think I've I think I've asked all of the questions that have come through the chat room. So I so now I'm going to ask my question. Yes, yes, please. And one one is for somebody who is interested in trying a low carb diet but is really prone to hypoglycemia, uh, which is my experience. Um, do you have suggestions for kind of easing into it? Of course. Personally, I wear an insulin pump, so I have a basal rate, which will require adjustment and um, insulin to carb ratios that may or may not need to change at some point. But 
I have low blood sugar a lot, and I end up eating tons of carbohydrates in glucotabs and jam and just pure sugar. What are your suggestions for easing somebody into a lower carb diet with that situation? Okay, so I would do it kind of gradually, um, but I have to say there's been some uh, research. There hasn't been a lot of type 1 research on low carb diets in the United States. It's all type 2, but in Sweden, they've done some research on people with type 1 and actually found out that they have fewer hypoglycemic episodes on a low carb diet. And this is because you need less insulin. You're taking less insulin because you're taking fewer carbs. And if you're, you know, let's say, I'm, let's say, I, I know you had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch because you told me you did. Um, so you bolus for that just based on your carb to insulin ratios. Um, so, you know, let's say you assumed that that was about, I don't know, uh, depends how much peanut butter and jelly you use, but let's say it was 45 grams, 50 grams of carb, 50 grams of carb, and you bolus for that. But was it really 50 grams of carb? Are, you know, are all of the package, um, the, the nutrition facts labels correct? Was it really more like 35 grams of carb, but you bolus for 50? Versus if you had, let's say, a chicken salad for lunch, and you thought it was maybe 10 grams of carb, and you bolus for 10, but it was really only eight grams of carb, it's not going to drop you as low. You're only off a little bit. So it's actually, that's where, you know, this is Dr. Bernstein's law of small numbers, I think it's called. Um, so as far as transitioning in, though, I would maybe just start, I would start slow for you just because you are so prone to hypoglycemia, but I, I don't, I don't want you necessarily to go straight into like Dr. Bernstein, even though some people out there probably think I should tell you, yes, that's what she needs. I would say maybe just transition into it slowly. And, you know, whatever you're doing now, maybe have your carbohydrate amount, have the insulin amount, I mean, drop it by half, and, and see how you do with that and see if that makes any difference. Because you will be, again, if you're off, you're not going to be off much. Because I'm thinking that's what it is. Maybe you're not absorbing all of the carbohydrates. Maybe it's something, you know, and also the timing. It's really difficult to know exactly when the insulin is going to be absorbed and exactly when your meal is going to be absorbed. So it's a, it's a very common problem in people with type 1. And I do think that lower carb intake. But these people were not following Dr. Bernstein. They were doing about 70 grams of carb. So, and they had improved a great, um, I think they had 85% reduction in hypoglycemia. Wow. You know that, but it was a lot. If it wasn't 85, it was right up there. It was a lot. It was a I lot. Want I, I want you to have it, too. I, I do encourage you to, to try and, to, and, and just to see. I know it's tough, and you've had diabetes a long time, and you're used to eating the way you want you eat. Um, but, it's <laughs> but it's something just to consider, because I think it could be beneficial. Mm -hmm. And then you have, one, you have another question, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. Uh -huh. I do. I have one more question, and this is just to just to make things even harder. Is that I'm a vegetarian who doesn't like eggs. <laughs> what kinds of? And actually, Marie in the chat room reminded me that perhaps I have a question relating to low carb dieting and yeah. being a vegetarian. Um, what kind of suggestions do you have for vegetarians who are interested in going low carb? Um, well, do you eat dairy? Yes. Okay, good, good. That'll that'll make it easier. <laughs> then you can do cheese, you can do Greek yogurt, you can do ricotta cheese um, for some of your protein. Um, you do you eat fish or no fish? I do actually eat fish. Okay, that's great. So there you go. Those are your those will be like your two main sources of protein that's low in carbs. Um, I'm assuming now you probably eat beans and things like that. Beans are really high in fiber, so. If you're going to be cutting your carbs in other ways, I, you know, beans are like I would say the the highest lowest GI foods, and you know you have type one. Is that really going to make a difference? It's got a lot of fiber, so you can kind of eat more beans than you would some of the other, um, you know, like rice and potatoes and things like that. So um, I would recommend doing more Greek yogurt, plain. Um, you know, so you're going to be cutting back on carbs. You got to up the fat. So if you're okay with upping the fat. Um, yeah, so whole, whole delicious. Fat. I'm fine with that. Delicious. It is delicious. So whole fat dairy, uh, avocado, um, uh, you know, coconut oil, all of those things to kind of make up the calories that you're going to be decreasing in the carbs, and you know, continue to do vegetables, fruits, nuts. Nuts are great. Um, you know, some of them have more carbs than others, but I think you continue to continue to enjoy those, and and just see how you do with it. 
again, you don't have to go super drastic right now. You may decide, you know, that you like it and want to go lower or maybe not, but uh, I think it's worth a try, and especially if you're having a lot of hypos. I think that taking less insulin, um, it, it might really, you know, work out for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you, we have one more question. Yeah, yeah. For exactly one more question. You mentioned yogurt as a good source of protein, mm -hmm. and Shoshana in our chat room is asking, what are your thoughts on yogurt that's sweetened with sugar versus artificial sweeteners? So we could expand the question to, what are your thoughts on artificial sweeteners? <laughs> oh boy, and I, I have quite a few on those. The, the problem like that with yogurt, they're usually sweetened with aspartame, like the uh, Yoplait and some of those, which I do not like. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's a good... I would prefer you, Shoshana, to do plain yogurt, and if you don't like the taste, if it's yucky to you, then I would add some erythritol or stevia to it and some cinnamon or something else to flavor it up. Um, and that way you're not getting a lot of carbs and you're getting a sweet taste, but you're not getting some of the, um, I think, more problematic sugar substitutes. So erythritol is, is a sugar alcohol, but it doesn't affect blood sugar the way that a lot of the others do. It doesn't cause any of the GI upset that the others do. And, uh, and then the stevia is natural, but it kind of has a little funky aftertaste sometimes to it. That's why I'm saying put some maybe some uh, cinnamon or some other flavoring. Or You can eat it also with berries. I like it plain, but it kind of does taste like sour cream. So um, it's pretty a little more sour than sour cream. So. Francisca, we've run out of time, but we actually do have one more question. Can you can you? Oh, of course. No, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. So our question, for, final question, you guys, is um, this one is from Claire in the chat room who says. Um, who's asking if you deduct the fiber from the carb number completely or only half of the fiber from the carbs? Here's again where there's no consensus on this. I personally, I don't take insulin. I deduct it. I deduct it in my daily. So when I say I do about 30 to 35 grams, that's my net intake. I deduct all the fiber. There are people who deduct half the fiber when the uh, carb count, I believe, is over 5. I mean, the fiber is over 5, they'll deduct half of it. Uh, or in some people, when it's over five, they'll deduct all of it. So it's really up to you. I think for people with diabetes who are taking insulin, you do need to deduct at least part of it because it does not affect your blood sugar. At least the insoluble fiber does not affect it at all. So if you have some, if you're you know bolusing for something that's 30 grams of carb, but yet it contains 10 grams of fiber and you don't deduct from it, you're going to have a low blood sugar, or you probably are going to have a low blood sugar because you're not. You're taking into you're not taking into account that you know a third of that is not going to be digested, so and absorbed and, and raise your blood sugar. So that's what I would say is you have to deduct at least a portion of it. How much you want to deduct, half of it or all of it, um, is up to you. If you deduct all of it, then and 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 some of it does digest. There's a, a little bit of soluble fiber that does digest. You might be a little bit higher, but um, I think that's still safer than not deducting any, and then you end up with a low. All right. All right. Rizaka, thank you so much. This oh, is you're awesome. welcome. This I is really enjoyed cool. it. Oh, I'm so glad. I really enjoyed it. I'm so glad. We've had me. we've had great participation in the chat room. People have really enjoyed you. And in the chat room, y'all, I'm going to post um, the link to Francisca's blog again. Mm -hmm. uh, low carb nutrition. No, low carb dietitian. dietitian sorry. That's fine. And uh, thank you all for being here. And Francisca. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and the great work that you're doing. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, Emily. I so enjoyed it, and it was just great talking to you and uh, taking questions from everybody. Enjoyed it a lot. Cool. Okay. Good. We will be in touch. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.